Hey what's up everyone and welcome to the remake review, the mini series where I share my thoughts and feelings about three chapters at a time from the Final Fantasy VII remake. This review will contain spoilers all the way throughout for the whole game and lore so if you are yet to finish the game or it's a 1997 original, please click off the video and save it when you've finished either or. With that being said, let's mosey. Before this episode begins I would just like to apologise for what happened in the last episode uh, and that is a audio mixing error, I forgot to lower the audio of the music uh, in some sections of the video making my audio almost un inaudible essentially uh, and there's no and I can't fix it so I apologize for that but to smut my point that I was saying um, the rest of chapter 14 is basically boring but it does give some a, a good development and interesting development to Leslie in my opinion but also it's the gameplay just makes it uninteresting to the point where I couldn't give a shit the rematch with Abzu is pretty cool though and the start of chapter 15 is actually quite nice. It's, it's scenic, it's fun. The aerial combat could have been tweaked a little bit more to make it a bit better. But I, I enjoy the realism, the comedy, and also um, just the, the scenery in general as well as the music. So they're just the points that I made uh, to, you know, to sum it up briefly. But anyways, on with today's video. Chapter 16 is one of the chapters I was the most nervous about coming into the remake, as in the original it was only such a small thing. Like, scaling the Shinra building was nothing more than either a couple of fun battles or around five minutes of climbing a fleet of stairs. Now that was basically it, you did a little bit more exploring, picked up a few collectibles and what went on with your day. But in this game, they made the Shinra building its own, it's the entirety of it, well not the entirety, but the key areas of it, its own playable area, and I think it was handled great. So we start off in the reception, at, well before that, we sneak in through the parking garage which fails miserably because of Barrett again. We then proceed to go inside of the lobby which is empty for obvious reasons, whether, you know, because it's security, she was trying to keep everyone out. Uh, and we end up playing as Tifa uh, on her own, doing some parkour across these lampshades, which fails. Which we then decide to scale um, these towers by doing some parkour and using the monkey bars. Well, what look like monkey, well the scaffolding is monkey bars, pretty much. Um, and it's it's fine enough, I suppose. It's not the most interesting gameplay in the world, but I suppose it creates for a nice set piece. Uh, but we get this key card, which we will then obviously take into mind. That key cards get us around this building. So obviously that that's a nice little introduction to the building. But anyways, we'll proceed up the floors. We'll see how absolutely gorgeous the view of Midgar is that Shinra has. And also how diverse each different floor is, whether that be the ones uh, sprawling with a big tree in the middle, uh, weapons development, or even the tall. And that's where this chapter basically, you know, it takes itself. It turns itself into a tour of the Shinra building to keep us, you know, undetected in some light of manner. Um, so essentially what we do is we'll take this tour of the different floors of the Shinra building. So we'll, we'll do weapons development uh, and then we'll go on to urban planning, things like that. Showcase of President Shinra's accomplishments, you know, blah, 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 things along those lines. Um, but before we get to that stage, we get to take the absolutely humorous task of either climbing the stairs or taking the elevator. Climbing the stairs lasts around five minutes like the original game and the character spurts some pretty hilarious dialogue with you slowing down as well as you get closer to the top, which I thought was quite nice. Um, but then if you take the elevator, you'll come across a few random encounters and then one where you absolutely scare the shit out of a civilian and I thought it was really funny. Um, like. Both, both are really funny options, and they don't give any different um, outcomes, as far as I know. Um, having played through this game twice and doing both things, so I'm I'm not sure if they do or don't. But one of the highlights for me throughout the entirety of uh, this chapter was obviously um, Domino, because it, it's you know it's Mayor Domino, Mayor the best. Um, I, I was curious to see how he would play his role, and I think it, and I think he was handled quite nice. Uh, but moving on from that, the key thing that I took away from this chapter that I thought was the best thing was uh, seeing the scale model of the Shinra, uh, not Shinra, sorry, seeing the scale model of Midgar and then the CGI cutscene uh, that follows through this like virtual reality chamber. It was, it was so cool. Like, we get to see how the ancients lived. This is a first thing. We got to see the ancient life, uh, you know, how Earth used to look before Shinra. Think, you know things like that uh, and then it gets interrupted at the end by Sephiroth which gives us a vision of Meteor and a destroyed Midgar and it was around these last three chapters where Sephiroth and Meteor start making their appearances a lot more frequently and I think it's nice how they do it this way but I would rather it not be in 
in Midgar at all. Because I like how we were just alluded to Sephiroth throughout the entirety of Midgar and we first see him, well, on a f in the Nibelheim flashback, but then in person on a fucking boat. But I think they should have saved Sephiroth a lot more in this game. Uh, but it's it's still fine by me because the cutscene was fucking amazing and it provided a nice view um, into ancient life. Uh, we do a little bit more of what we did in the original game, you know, crawling through events, spying on Jinra, um, interrogating Hojo, and meeting Nanaki. Holy shit. Like, he is so fucking cool in this game. I love Nanaki in this game. This is the best uh, depiction of the character today, and it's the best design, and I love it. Uh, but the chapter ends with Cloud saying mother. Now, this is obviously the Genova cells and the reunion taking place, but it was a, it's such a strange ending to the chapter, especially because we don't know what this is. And new players will be just as confused as uh, returning players alike. And I think they could have handled this a little bit better if they explained it more in previous chapters. But we'll soon find out in the next game as we travel to Nibelheim, I'd assume. Chapter 17 is interesting enough as we get to see Hojo's lab, but at the same time, I'm not the biggest fan of it because it is it's essentially one big gauntlet, it's a big dungeon. We, we, we scale Hojo's uh, advanced laboratory where he holds Genova um, and we just, we basically just get to the top to escape. That's literally the, the plot for this chapter. But gameplay wise, I think it's kind of nice because not only do we get to um, play as different characters in different scenarios, such as Cloud on his own with Nanaki coming to help, Cloud and Barrett in a dungeon, Tifa and Aerith in a dungeon, etc uh, etc et I think it was quite nice uh, give us that diversity and it tested our abilities as each character and we also got to use and we, we well considering he's not playable we got to do something with Nanaki as he was able as we used him to run across these little gates to pull a switch which led to more puzzle solving as some switches weren't always available he had to switch teams using a PHS uh, etc etc you know it's just things like that also I just realized I'm calling red 13 Nanaki that's a Spoiler, but I did say at the start of these videos spoilers, so don't shout at me. Uh, I just I'm used to calling him the Nokia at this point, anyways. Um, we end off the chapter in a very well, yeah, I'd say in a frightening but absolutely incredible way. We fight Genova. Now let me explain. So before we get to this point, Sephiroth steals uh, Genova's body from uh, you know the capsule where she's been held like he does in the original game but this time we're following Genova's blood as she's leaked all over the floors rather than the blood of Sephiroth's victims in the Shinra tower which is a, which would have been a very very horrific sight but it would have made the game in 18 so they had to obviously tone that down and make it Genova's blood because alien blood doesn't count as sensitive media I suppose um, but yeah so we don't follow a blood stain um, all around the tower and instead of seeing President Shinra impaled, we instead see um, him hanging from the edge of the tower. And another difference to point out is that we're not arrested and sent to a cell, which is then when we follow the blood. Um, instead, what happens is, after Cloud passes out at the end of the previous chapter, we're, ta uh, we're taken to that cell by uh, the party, essentially. You know, we're, sent, we're, go we're going to Arif's previous um, home, you could say in order to recover, get back on our feet and things like that. I thought that was kind of cool because uh, in this th in this game, like we don't just find Shinra impaled, like I said, we save him and then he holds us at gunpoint, which is a bit more interesting. Uh, but then, Fate plays its course, Sephiroth comes behind him, kills him, and then kills Barrett, surprisingly. This is something completely new that took me off guard. Um, and yes, he does get revived, but it's, it's, it's still something new. And it shows us a little bit more about how the Whispers work. So, anyways... Genova, this fight is incredible, honestly incredible, the atmosphere is great, the music, oh my god, the fucking music. Uh, the music's amazing, um, like, it, it makes you take advantage of almost everything in your arsenal, this is the last... Um, normal boss fight before the final boss. That's a lie. We fight Rufus. This is the second to last normal fight before the final boss. The second, the, the last alien fight, you could say. Um, yeah, and it's, it's a great fight. It's really fun. It's fast paced and it's very entertaining as well. Uh, voice crack. Moving on, we then see the arrival of Rufus and we fight Rufus. This fight is more or less the same as Reno. You just stand there and you 
either parry him or you wait for him to reload. That is basically the fight. And it could have been a lot better, I think. It's, it's stylish and it's cool and it's kind of nice how he actually has something to do with Darkstar this time rather than him just being another opponent to take out. Like You have to kill Darkstar first before you move on to fighting just Rufus. You can use Darkstar, you know, like triple slash Darkstar and Rufus to break the link between them. Because uh, if you have the link, they can do these mad combos. I think it's I think it's really nice, um, and it's it gets you brain thinking. It makes you think rather than spam. Uh, so that's cool. So I thought that was really cool, really nice. Straight after our battle with Rufus, we fight the Arsenal with the other party members. There's nothing special about this fight. It's just a box standard boss fight. It's just a simmered down hell house that requires less magic, if you ask me. Um, but the best part of the chapter, hands down is the escape from the Shinra building. Oh my god, it's so fucking cool. I'm gonna let it play, actually. So then, what is this ragtag group of misfits I see before me? Avalanche! Local florist! Lab rat dog. <laughs> and where are the rest of you? Up your ass. <laughs> Charming, though not what I would have chosen as my last words. Secure the agent. <laughs> But feel free to kill both the idiot and the dog. <sighs> Eric, you saved my Marlene. Now, it's time I return the favor. Wait! orchestral root score of the main theme of FF7 as Cloud jumps off on the Daytona to just take out every Shinra soldier on the bottom floor is incredible. It's so good. And while I do have a soft spot for the original scene, you know, because it looks like Wallace and Gromit, it, it's so cool. I love this so much. This it's just, It just makes the escape all that much better and uh, the build up to the final chapter all the more uh, insane. So the final chapter begins and I'll be honest with you, it's a little bit of a mess. So, it starts off with some Barrett and Red 13 love. 
can we get some appreciation for Happy Red? Um, moving on, we do the bike mini game where we fight this the massive six wheel thing. I can't remember its name. I'm, I apologise. Um, it says it on screen probably, but yeah, we we fight the thing, which is a really really fun bike mini game. It's the, it's the second and last bike mini game, and it's probably the best one because this one doesn't just make you drive through a tunnel with some interactions. This one you have to think out what you're doing because this thing has so many different attacks uh, and it does have an attack pattern to follow as well. But when we reach the end of the line, the final boss commences, but before it does, this happens. We drag our asses all this way. This is the welcome we get. Who the fuck is that? I, right, I know it's Zack. Right, and I, I do know it's Zack. Zack is my favourite video game character of all time. But what did they do to him? Oh my god. When he came on screen, I was freaking the shit. I was freaking out. Like, you can tell it's Zack because of the way the blade's pointing. I mean, it could be Angeal, but he's dead. Um, but the way the blade points... That means it's Zack, because Cloud has it opposite. So I was freaking out. The camera's going up, you can see he's her. Yep, there we go, I'm freaking out even more. The camera pans. And we see this really weird looking version of Zack. Like, he doesn't have that one her strand that po that po pokes out anymore. It's like three different ones that, that blow in the wind. It, um, it sounds like someone's squeezing his left testicle the whole time he talks. And he looks really, really pudgy. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not shaming his design. Well, I am. Like, but I'm, I'm not shaming it, I'm complaining it, because it doesn't look like the Zack I know and love. Zack means so much to me, he's so special to me, and I don't like what they, they, they've done with him. He sounds like a cocky, upright, stuck-up little bastard, and I absolutely fucking hate it. And I don't like his design, he just looks stupid in my opinion, compared to what he looked like in Crisis Core. But, moving on before I end up having an aneurysm, uh, that cutscene plays and it, and it just happens. And then we get transplant, and then we go through the portal to some mad trippy world, which is where we fight the Arbiter of Fate. It's you know, destiny. We fight destiny, and it is so meta. And like I, I'm not. I don't want to sound like a whingy cunt, but that's what. But that's basically what I'm being, because I have a lot of things to whinge about here. It's so meta. But because it's meta, I like it. But at the same time, I can't get to grips with it because we, we never explain. It's never explained properly how these things function in different realities and timelines. Uh, it, it's it's confusing. But we keep having flash forwards to Advent Children scenes. So that is basically the the future of one timeline. And notice how I'm saying timelines. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Um, so yeah, we fight this massive Kingdom Hearts looking thing, and it's a it's a fun fight. It's fair. It's a fair fight. I'm not complaining, I quite like it. Um, the fight with the Rainbow Bahamut's kind of cool. Uh, if you don't already have the summon, it's a nice little teaser. Um, but we, we finish it off, and then we get another CGI cutscene, which is gorgeous. And then Sephiroth shows up, like, why are you here? Why are you the final fight in the game? You're not supposed to be fightable until the end of the game. That is what makes Sephiroth special, why he's the final boss. He's eluded to the entire time until we eventually get to fight him and see how strong he is and, he, and he's got a god complex and things like that. He just shows up all the time here and there's no power scaling because he's, he's he already seems OP as fuck. And when he slashes his sword down, it looks like Advent Children. What is... I don't understand what's going on. I have a lot of things to complain about, but the CGI is gorgeous, I'll admit that. But then the fight starts playing and the music... Crazy motherfuckers did it. They made one winged angel a part of the game. Am I complaining? No, because it's one of the best tracks in the game. It's a fantastic remix, probably the best version of one winged angel. If not this one, it's Advent Children. I can't decide between the two, but they both represent different versions of Sephiroth. For example, the original one winged angel represents Sephiroth and his god complex. Crisis Core is when he's just going insane. Advent Children is he's out for revenge. But this game seems like a really weird blend of um, Advent Children and the original because he has the insanity and he has the anger and things like that. But 
we're never explained anything about Sephiroth. He's just kind of a lurking threat that Cloud keeps envisioning throughout the entirety of the game. So it makes it less impactful. Um, but anyways, the fight itself is oh, it's so good. It's one of the best fights in the game, hands down. It's very cinematic. It's very cool. You have to, and it keeps your brain ticking because you can't keep spamming at Sephiroth because he'll be immune to your swipes or he'll parry you. Um, and I just complained about that with Rufus. But the thing is with Sephiroth, that isn't the only thing he does. He does all these different crazy moves. And if you attack him at the wrong time, in the wrong place, he has the chance to insta-kill you. Uh, from what I from what I um, experienced anyway. And I thought that was really nice. How they're actually making him seem like a powerful four rather than someone you can just fucking mash square at. So that, so yeah, that, that, that that's really nice. And also depending on the rela related, depending on the relationships you build with the characters throughout the game, they will appear in the fight in different orders. So for me, in my first playthrough, I had Aerith, Tifa, then Barrett. But in my second playthrough, I had Tifa, Barrett, then Aerith. Don't ask why Aerith was last. I definitely wasn't being a prick to Aerith. Anyways, um, I thought it was really cool. But yeah, it's a cool fight. Uh, and the ending... Oh, I have another thing to complain about. They recreate the fight in Cloud's memory. Why would you do that in the first part of a multi-game series? I understand it's fan service. I get it's nostalgia. But you're not going to have Cloud and Sephiroth face off in the duel after going through that massive shiny memory tunnel thingy in the first part. Because it's it just... It, it, if you're doing it again in the final part, it's just not... It's not going to be as impactful. You should have saved it. But the fight, I'm not complaining, it's cool, but you have Goku doing... Yeah, I'm going to say Goku. You have a, you have blonde Goku, Super Saiyan Goku, doing a whole lot of instant transmission throughout the fight. Um, for some godforsaken reason. Um, but yeah, uh, Clint gets his sword knocked away, and Sephiroth says seven seconds till the end, which has brought so many theories to my mind and everyone else's mind. Is this referring to Aerith? Is this referring to the meteor? What is this referring to? Nobody knows. Nobody knows, and I quite frankly couldn't care less at this point, because until we get some concrete evidence of what it could be, then I'm just going to leave it out of my mind, because it makes no fucking sense. But here's something I haven't heard anyone bring up. This, the stars, remind me of Sefer Sephiroth. And I'll put a little bit of, I'll put an image on the screen. It looks like Sefer Sephiroth to his side, like the bottom bit being his wings, etc, you know. I might be the only one that's seen that, but I don't know. Anyways, we get our ending cutscene. And the ending cutscene also baffles me. Because not only do we see Zack surviving the Shinra uh, ambush, but also a different stamp. And by stamp I mean the dog. We see a different stamp on the packet of crisp. So this is implying that in an alternate timeline or universe, Zack survives. So what about this one? What happens in the later events of that? I have no idea. It makes no sense. Also, Big survives. Like, why? And then they also tease Jesse's survival. And notice how I haven't mentioned Wedge. Why have I not mentioned Wedge? Because I have no idea what happened to him. He was blown out of the Shinra building and we never saw from him again. Did he survive? Did he not? What happened? Hmm. But anyways, because we defeated Destiny, essentially, we're allowing for these things to happen in other timelines. Uh, you know, so Zack Zach and Cloud getting to Midgar. You know, things like that. But in the final cutscene, it's just the cast saying how they're going to set out to kill Sephiroth. Uh, in an alternate timeline, Zack is coming with Cloud to the cliff where he dies. And mind you, in the original game, he gets shot on that cliff rather than ambushed. So in the next game, we could see that. Who knows? But Aerith and Zack sense each other from different timelines because obviously Aerith's an ancient and she can do all this special shit. Uh, and it's just like a love thing, in it? Because, you know, the, Zack was Aerith's first love. You know, things like that. Uh, it's it's kind of confusing, and I'm, I'm uh, kind of confusing. I mean, it's very, very confusing. Um, so yeah, as cool as chapter 18 might be, it really baffles me with some of the the decisions they decided to make. Uh, but also, I'm not complaining because it's one of the most fun to replay. So you're sacrificing decent story things for uh, an enjoyment of your gameplay, I suppose. So it's a mixed bag for me. I'm not entirely sure how to sum it up. At the end of the day, the remake review has almost come to its end. Now you might be thinking, but we've we've done all 18 chapters, what's more? I'm going to do a 7th episode, Final Fantasy 7, uh, which is basically my pros and my cons of the game and what I want for the next instalment. You don't have to watch the next video um, if you don't want to. You know, I'd appreciate it if you did, but I understand if you don't, because I've basically already said all that 
within the space of these six episodes, but if, it's, it's going to act as a summary episode, essentially. I've already got the thumbnail preferred for it, pre preferred, prepared for it and things like that. I just need to edit it, all right? So it will be up some point next week or within the coming week uh, from this video's upload. Uh, I have no idea. But anyways, a brief summary on these chapters. Chapter 16 was handled really well, and I was surprised with it. It wasn't the best chapter in the game. It was far from the best chapter in the game, but I suppose it was nice. Chapter 17 was a very mixed bag because I, did, I wasn't a fan of the progressive dungeon thing. You know, the whole, it was a lot of back and forth, and there wasn't that many character moments in it. Uh, but towards the end, it kind of picked up. Chapter 18 is really fun towards the start and throughout the end as well. But this, but the lore and the character, everything's all over the place when it comes to the lore of Chapter 18. So yeah, there you go. I'll catch you all in Episode 7, the finale of the remake review. Thank you for watching. Take care. Have a wonderful day.